uh, thanks to everybody who's logged on and welcome to this third in the series of webinars that the uh, IFLA Academic and Research Library Standing Committee has, has started doing these years on uh, you know, really topics that are of interest to our, uh, to our community. So we're interested in hearing from any of you, any of you who are dialed in on uh, uh, topics you'd like to see covered in the future. Uh, please, please let us know and we will, we will uh, bring these things together. The, the program, the webinar program uh, grew out of some suggestions that we received at the conference last year. Uh, we do plan to continue this occasional series through next year. We've got one, we're already working on planning one webinar um, on, on uh, supporting, supporting research in developing countries, which will happen uh, after the conference, so happen in September. Um, so thanks everybody for, for, and we've had really good attendance at these, so I'm very happy to, to, to have you all turning out and be participating. So with that intro, I am going to turn it over to our speakers today. And since I now don't have my notes in front of me, uh, Jody, I'm just going to let you guys introduce yourselves um, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Um, I will, as soon as I get my, I'm working on my computer, but I will be monitoring chat for those of you who would know who have questions or comments. So please jump in there and then uh, and I will uh, forward your questions through chat to our speakers when, um, when they as they come up. Okay, very good. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now so you can all see. Is that coming through okay, Jody? I can see it fine. It looks good to me. Okay. Yeah, it looks good. All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Ted Polly. I am the Social Sciences and Digital Publishing Librarian at IUPUI University Library. And I'm uh, joined by uh, my colleague, Jody Bailey. I'll let her introduce herself now. Good morning, my name is Jody Bailey. I'm the head of the Scholarly Communications Office at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, United States. And I should say that uh, both Jody and I are on the board of the Library Publishing Coalition, uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. But today we are going to be talking about uh, academic libraries engaging in publishing, a burgeoning service model uh, in the open access sphere. So what is library publishing? Uh, the Library Publishing Coalition defines it as a set of activities led by college and university libraries to support the creation, dissemination, and curation of scholarly, creative, and or educational works. In general, library publishing strives for openness, inclusivity, and sustainability. Uh, in her review of the, the field um, for library trends, uh, Melanie Schlosser identified six key characteristics of library publishing. Uh, first, it's often responsive. So it's typically driven by local needs uh, in terms of both the output of what is published and the publishing workflow. Uh, it's often characterized by an emphasis on core services. Um, so rather than providing a complete suite of services that you might expect from a commercial publisher like in-house copy editing and layout, Library publishing tends to focus on core services uh, such as um, hosting, providing uh, space for journals to uh, providing platform space for journals, uh, and then occasionally some value added services like um, registering DOIs. Uh, it's also characterized by an emphasis on partnerships. So uh, library publishing and publishing in general tends to involve a, a deep collaboration and engagement with, uh, with our users. Uh, probably beyond that of traditional library services. Um, it's also characterized by openness. So most uh, library publishers, open access is the norm for their publications. Uh, another key characteristic is experimentation. So most library publishing operates under a sustainable or under a subsidy model rather than a cost recovery model. And uh, this allows uh, library publishers to take risks and um, whoops, uh, publish things that others may not. Um, sorry, I'm gonna close chat here. Uh, publish things that others may not. 
Um, and then finally, it's pedagogical in nature. So uh, this stems partly from libraries' deep commitment to student learning and uh, focus on information literacy. And this comes through in many library publishing services. Uh, and that's reflected in their publication of student research journals, uh, publishing of open educational resources, and even student employment um, is an opportunity for uh, students to learn about publishing and uh, scholarly, scholarly communication. <clears throat> So why do libraries publish? <clears throat> Broadly, it aligns with our values, um, access and discovery, preserving the scholarly record. Uh, it provides an excellent opportunity to demonstrate value throughout the research life cycle. So as academic libraries begin to shift away from more traditional models to providing new services like data management, consultation, um, digitization, uh, publishing provides an opportunity for us to uh, demonstrate value throughout the research life cycle. Uh, it's an opportunity to help disseminate uh, faculty and student research at a local level. Um, so publishing things that um, uh, our faculty and students create. Um, and also uh, library publishing is a good opportunity to publish things that might not otherwise be published. So as I just mentioned, most library publishers operate under a subsidy model um, rather than cost recovery. And this allows library publishers to uh, publish research that uh, might not have uh, a market even in uh, by academic publishing standards. So things that are hyper niche, uh, material of local concern, or uh, voices that are uh, tend to be marginalized in traditional scholarly publishing, uh, and even new forms of uh, scholarly output. Uh, many of us who work in this field see library publishing as a way to create a more equitable and just system of scholarly communication, and that's an emphasis of many of our programs. And then finally, it simply provides an alternative to mainstream publishing. So who benefits from library publishing? Uh, disciplines that are not well served by commercial publishers. So this can include uh, some of the humanities and social sciences um, and uh, things for which there are relatively small markets even by academic publishing standards. Uh, journals, with, journals and um, other outputs with practice-based readership. So, um, and these would be people working outside of academia that may not have access to journal subscriptions. Um, so people working in social work, public health, education. Uh, so in general, uh, research publications with practice-based readerships benefit greatly from library publishing. Uh, students, as I mentioned before, uh, both in terms of having their own research published and in terms of um, being able to access the open educational resources that many library publishing uh, programs produce. Uh, and since open access tends to be the norm for most library publishers, uh, readers and scholars around the world uh, benefit greatly from library publishing. So a brief history of uh, library publishing. So uh, historically, libraries have been involved, even if tangentially, in scholarly production. Uh, one example of this is um, there are actually uh, librarians involved in the founding of, of some prominent university presses, the University of California Press and UNC Press being examples of that. Um, in moving into the 1990s, uh, libraries were heavily involved in the development of scholarly digital platforms. Um, so Project Muse and Highwire Press are often pointed to as examples of this. Uh, in 1998, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition formed and began serving as a catalyst for open access and campus-based scholar-led publishing initiatives. And then in the early 2000s, a lot of the, the platforms that we depend on began to appear. So uh, DSpace, Open Journal Systems, and BPress, and these provided the much needed and accessible infrastructure that supports library publishing. And then the, what we tend to think of as kind of the modern era of library pub publishing uh, sort of begins in 2013, uh, coalesces in 2013 with the formation of the Library Publishing Coalition. So a little bit about the Library Publishing Coalition. The LPC is an independent community-led membership association of academic and research libraries and library consortia engaged in scholarly publishing. Its mission is to extend the impact, sustainability of library publishing and open scholarship by providing a professional forum for developing best practices and shared experiences, or sharing expertise rather. Um, 
So uh, the LPC was founded in 2013 with 61 academic libraries in collaboration with the Educopia Institute. Uh, there are currently 81 members. Uh, and by and large, most of these members are North American based, but we do have a few international members. Um, and our membership includes libraries and consortia that are either currently publishing or considering publishing. So you don't have to be actively publishing uh, to become a member. Uh, some of the benefits uh, to being a member with the LPC uh, include engagement in an international community of practice. Uh, and this happens in a variety of ways through the LPC listserv and uh, most notably at our annual library publishing forum. Many of our members look at uh, their membership as a way to jumpstart or enhance their library publishing initiatives uh, through uh, professional development opportunities such as webinars and access to our shared documentation portal, as well as a number of other resources that we create and, and disseminate. And then finally, it's an opportunity to lead change in scholarly communication and publishing through participation in committees, task forces, and a growing highly collaborative community of practice. So here are some of the resources. I won't go over these um, in great detail, but you all will have the slides here. And so I've, we've linked some uh, key resources that the Library Publishing Coalition has created. Uh, the only one that is limited currently to members are some of the items in the shared documentation portal, but a number of these others are uh, openly available for anyone to look at. And I'll finish up by talking a little bit about uh, library university press partnerships. Uh, this is something that's becoming more common in the field of library publishing. Uh, often library publishing programs are seeking to collaborate with their university press colleagues. Uh, and this can take many different forms, but I think uh, Charles Watkinson in his chapter on the topic uh, provides a nice uh, taxonomy of the different types of relationships. Uh, I won't spend any time talking about type one relationship because it's characterized by the absence of a relationship between library publishing and university press, but I'll talk a little bit about the, the other four. So type two partnerships uh, are um, where there's a good relationship between the library publishing unit and the university press, but there's no formal reporting structure. Um, so these types of partnerships can produce uh, one-off projects or even ongoing publications. And typically there's some formal agreement that outlines the, what the different parties uh, will be responsible for, but there's no actual formal reporting between the, um, from the press to the library. Uh, type three partnerships are um, characterized by uh, joint projects uh, and a formal reporting structure, but relative autonomy between the two units. Um, so these types of um, Partnerships can include uh, shared personnel between the press and the library, or perhaps a, a, a boundary spanning unit like an office of scholarly publishing. Uh, and there is a direct uh, formal reporting structure from the press to the library. Uh, type four partnerships take it a little one step further and the press actually moves into the library. So there's a physical co-location uh, and there's a direct reporting structure from the uh, press to the library administration. Uh, but there's still a relative, uh, relatively high level of autonomy between what the press is working on and what the library publishing unit is working on. And uh, this likely stems just from the newness of these types of partnerships um, when a press uh, moves into the library and uh, there isn't that tight integration uh, in the very beginning. And then type five partnerships is kind of the culmination of the collaboration between the library uh, publishing unit and a university press. And so these are fully integrated partnerships uh, and they often include shared vision. It may include some joint strategic planning uh, and shared marketing. One of the examples that's often pointed to as a, um, a type five partnership is Michigan Publishing. So I will now turn it over to Jody to talk about library administrative units involved in publishing. Okay, thank you, Ted. And as Ted mentioned, um, I want to um, let you guys know again that the our slides here will be um, available to you as a PDF. So all of these links will be live in the slides um, if you care to explore some of these um, resources a little more fully. So some of the ways that library publishing is set up in various academic libraries, um, they, they are the 
the options are varied. Um, and so in, in my particular um, case at Emory University, most of the library publishing as far as expansive digital projects, um, journals, and some monographs are published through the Center for Digital Scholarship. Um, and the, that is also the case where Ted is at IUPUI. Um, Ted works for the Center for Digital Scholarship in his library and heads up most of their publishing efforts. So um, sometimes it's within a digital scholarship center as in these two examples. Um, as Ted just mentioned, there are many examples where university presses and libraries work together. Michigan Publishing, again, is a really good example of that. Um, also at the University of North Texas, um, their library scholarly publishing services and their university press are very, um, they work very much hand in hand. At some uh, universities in North America, um, the library publishing services are located within an office of scholarly communications or um, a SCALCOM unit. So this would be the case at the University of Kansas um, where they actually do a lot of publishing out of their Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright. Um, and then in other libraries, in fact, this is where I used to work. My former position was at the University of Texas at Arlington. I was the director of publishing there. Um, that is just, uh, those publishing services are located in um, a couple of different units. Um, so it, it, it can vary a great deal. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So what kinds of materials do libraries publish? Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about, I have a couple of slides on this, are the kinds of things we can publish in institutional repositories. So you guys are probably all very familiar with these materials. These include things like theses and dissertations, um, journal articles that are first published elsewhere, but where the publisher allows a, re, um, a resharing of that material on an institutional repository. Um, they may include conference papers and presentations, as well as technical reports, white paper, and other great literature. Some of the platforms that are commonly used for institutional repositories um, include the Content DM platform from OCLC, um, the Digital Commons platform from B Press and Elsevier. Uh, Digital Commons was originally started by B Press, which was Berkeley Electronic Press. Um, and it was originally um, more university-based and then it was acquired by Elsevier a few years back. Um, so both Content DM and uh, Digital Commons are not open source platforms, whereas the other three I have listed here are. Um, these again are the most common ones. There are others out there. DSpace um, is commonly used, that was used at my last institution, Fedora and Samvera is currently being used at Emory, um, and then Islandora is another one. Can go forward, thanks. So other materials, other types of materials that library publish include more original content. Um, so journals, such as um, if you're publishing a whole journal and it's original material, it's not a journal article that's been published elsewhere and then reshared on an institutional repository. Um, monographs or books, expansive digital projects, textbooks, and other open educational resources and data sets. And some of the common platforms or tools for journals include open journal systems. Um, open journal systems uh, was started, as Ted mentioned, in the early 2000s by the Public Knowledge Project. It is an open source um, platform. Um, which means you don't have to pay to acquire it, but it's free like a puppy in the sense that um, if you want to use open journal systems, you're going to need a good bit of technical expertise to get it up and running um, on your own servers. Um, there is also Scholastica, which is not open source, Digital Commons, which I've already talked about. Um, a couple of newer platforms include Manifold, which is out of the University of Minnesota. Um, and PubPub, which is out of MIT. Um, and again, all of the um, items in this right-hand column with a little um, asterisk next to them, that indicates they are open source. 
Uh, for books, we have the option of the Open Monograph Press, um, which is also a PKP product. So that's from the same organization that brings us OJS, Open Journal Systems. Um, and then a newer platform is that's out of the University of Michigan is called Fulcrum. Um, and that one, as you can see in the next uh, line down, is also used for expansive digital projects. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get there. Um, and then Editoria is another open source platform. Um, so for expansive digital projects, let me talk a little bit about what these are in case you're not familiar with that term. Um, expansive digital projects are usually sort of like books on steroids. Um, so what I mean by that is that they are books that have a lot of interactive materials. They may have a lot of multimedia, such as um, interactive maps, video, um, audio files. Um, they may have things like um, interactive quizzes. So these in are, are items that can't really exist in print because of, of the um, inclusion of all of these interactive or multimedia elements. Um, and some of these newer platforms have been developed specifically to accommodate this kind of multimedia and interactivity. So Fulcrum, again, is a really good example of that. Um, and I'm going to be linking out in the next slide, I believe it is, or maybe a couple of slides down, to some examples of these types of projects. So when you guys got a copy of this um, presentation, uh, a copy of our slides, you'll be able to explore some of these projects and, and platforms. Um, so, yes? I just I had a, a question came in in the chat that I thought we would uh, might want to address right now, which is whether uh, Scalar or Omeka would be uh, platforms that you'd include in one of these categories, and would they be expansive digital projects as well? So I think that Omeka could be, um, and I know that Scalar has also been used for this type of um, material. Um, I think that. Um, I, I always tend to think of Omeka as being closer to a really good platform for online exhibits. Um, so it's really good for featuring artwork um, and other types of images. Um, I don't know that it has the same capability that Fulcrum and Manifold have to host other types of files. It may, and it just may be that I'm not as familiar with it. Ted, can you answer that question better than I can? Um, that's always been my sense, yeah, that Omeka is uh, a little bit more akin to a, 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 like a content management system um, designed kind of for scholarly digital humanities types of projects, but not quite uh, the same level of interactivity that you would get from something like Scalar. And then like Fulcrum and Manifold, as I said, these are newer options, but yes, Omeka and Scalar are definitely out there and they're platforms that are being used quite commonly. Um, as I said, I don't know that they have all of the um, versatility that a Fulcrum or a Manifold platform do. Um, Pressbooks is another new-ish new platform. I'm not sure exactly when it came, came out. Um, it is actually based on WordPress. So if you're familiar with using WordPress, um, Pressbooks actually has a pretty, um, a pretty similar backend, a pretty similar administrative side. The really cool thing about Pressbooks is that it does allow incorporation of a lot of multimedia. Um, it has H5P technology incorporated in it. So um, you can do things, especially for textbooks and open educational resources where you're going to include an interactive quiz um, and it's it's smart enough to where you know a student reading a textbook could take this quiz and then the the quiz will point them back to places in the text that they might want to go and refresh their um, understanding of those materials because they didn't do so well on certain questions on the quiz so it has lots of really cool things that you can do with it and it's being used quite commonly in for open educational resources in North America. Um, and one of the newer types of materials that libraries are starting to publish are data sets. Um, so I, in North America, in the United States um, in particular, many of our federal funding agencies, um, 
are requiring open sharing of data sets for uh, research that's conducted with um, monies from these agencies. So um, we have started helping our scholars, our faculty and graduate students mainly, by publishing, helping to publish these data sets um, and sharing them openly. And Dataverse is the, the platform that I know of that's being used most commonly in North America. Jody, Jody yeah. do you mind? I, there was another question that came up on that slide, so I just wanted to quickly, um, quickly ask. The, um, can you talk a little bit about what it means for a un university to manage a platform? So MIT and PubPub, um, you know, what does what does managing the platform mean? What is it that they're that they're really doing? So PubPub and um, Fulcrum are examples, um, as well as Manifold, are examples of platforms that have been conceived of and developed by universities in North America. Um, so they are doing the heavy lifting to actually create these platforms. They are being used by, so that you know, other universities are taking that open source um, software and installing it on their own servers to host their own um, items that are published under under those with those platforms. It's sort of like um, Microsoft has developed, you know, Microsoft Word, and they are the ones that actually create it, but other people use it locally. And that's sort of the difference. Am I, am I answering the question what that was asked? Um, Okay, I'm I'm going to assume that, that that is answered. But if I if I didn't clarify that, then um, let me know. And and the other thing is um, with a lot of these publishing platforms, if you don't have the local expertise to spin them up yourself, if you don't have a lot of technical help in your library, if you work in a smaller library, um, then you can actually pay for a hosted version of the platform. So the developers may offer that option. Um, it, just, it just depends on the platform. So we can move on. Okay, so this is the slide where I have a lot of examples and um, there are many, many more out there. I just sort of randomly chose um, some, of, some that I know um, have been done by members at member libraries um, for the Library Publishing Coalition. So the University of Pittsburgh is one of our member um, institutions and they publish over 40 original content journals. So they are a very um, active library publisher in the journal sphere. Um, and there is a link here to the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy that is hosted on the Open Journals um, platform, Open Journal platform, Open Journal Systems platform, excuse me. Um, another example from a different university, I wanted to give a couple here for journals, is Health Behavior Research that is hosted, um, it, it is published by Kansas State University and hosted on a digital commons platform um, through their new Prairie Press. Uh, there is also um, a monograph example here, Teaching Religion in a Changing Public University by ATLA Open Press. ATLA is um, a, one of our member institutions that is actually a consortium um, it is, it used to be, ATLA used to stand for the Association of Theological Libraries of America, I believe, but they are just called ATLA now. They, they no longer actually um, use that as an acronym. Um, and then a really cool expansive digital project, and this is one that is cited a lot as, as um, one of the foremost um, and, and most interesting examples of how um, you can really push these platforms to the limit, and this one is done in Fulcrum, is this Chinese deckscape. And it, um, it focuses on um, the, it's an interesting title, and I, I just wanna explain it a little bit because it sounds a little scary, but um, basically what it is is um, with the expansion of the economy in China, um, the Chinese government is moving many of the uh, many old cemeteries in China, and there are all kinds of social and cultural implications because of this. And this this book explores how um, how the the having to actually move these cemeteries in China is affecting um, society. 
So that is a really interesting um, brick that I, t I, I suggest you take a look at. It has a lot of interactive maps and really cool stuff in it. Um, an open educational resource published by the University of Saskatchewan uh, in the Pressbooks instance is, um, is linked here, Introduction to Electricity, Magnetism, and Circuits. And then I also have a link out to a data set from the University of North Carolina um, that is hosted in a Dataverse instance, and that is the campaign contributions to prosecutorial elections from 2014 to 2017. Okay, so the next slide I'm gonna talk about a little bit here are the kinds of services that libraries publishers provide. As Ted mentioned earlier, um, the core services is are, are for many of our member institutions is what they focus on. So they focus on hosting and they may not offer a whole lot else. Um, they may just have an institutional repository and host um, some of these materials within the repository and there may not be a lot else that they offer. It just depends on staffing and availability of, of the library to offer these services. Some libraries offer all of these services. So let's talk about what they may be. Um, so helping uh, our faculty and students that we work with obtain ISSNs for journals, DOIs for articles and ISBNs for books may be a service that is offered. Um, it may be that the library could assist with all aspects of the technical setup and production um, of every journal and book that's, that's published through them. Um, and that can sometimes include layout and copy editing. Um, it, 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 most frequently what we provide is the publishing platform. Um, and many of these publishing platforms uh, for journals in particular simplify the peer review process. So that is the beauty of the open journal systems platform that is used so commonly. Um, I think Digital Commons also offers this on the back end. Um, so it, it rather than the editors of the journal having to email files back and forth when peer review is happening, they can um, simply uh, organize all of that in the back end of the open journal systems um, platform and and it will um, it really helps to simplify the process you don't have to worry about keeping up with different versions of of the articles as they're going through peer review and that kind of thing um, and then one of the most important aspects that uh, library publishers definitely handle is ensuring that their content is hosted on a platform that is secure and also that has frequent backups and built-in redundancies. Um, and in particular, most libraries are gonna think about even geographic redundancies. So if they have a server that's locally hosting um, the, the content that they publish, they're probably also going to ensure that that server is backed up on, an, on, a, on another service, server that is on a different geographical region. So in case there is some kind of catastrophic failure locally, there's a copy of that content somewhere else. Um, one of the biggest um, services that library publishers provide is to help with questions around copyright. Um, so this can, these types of questions can range anywhere from what kind of license do we wanna put on the material that we're publishing? Um, frequently, as Ted mentioned, library publishers do focus on publishing open access materials um, and most frequently the types of license that are used on open access materials that libraries publish is a creative commons license however um, some libraries do publish materials with traditional copyright as well so we need people on staff who can help um, our our publishing partners on our campuses answer questions around um, and help them figure out how they want to license their content. However, that's not the only type of copyright expertise we need. We also need to be able to help those we're publishing with um, answer questions around what kinds of content they might include in the things they're publishing that may already be copyrighted. And if it is copyrighted, how can they get permissions to include those materials? Um, so there's there are thousands of questions that can come up around copyright. And um, it is really important if you're going to engage in library publishing to be able to help 
um, answer those questions. We also want to ensure that we're making our products discoverable um, and ways we can do that include search engine optimization and making sure that we have robust metadata. Um, this again is something that the library has expertise in that if somebody trying to do this kind of publishing on their own may not um, understand these types of issues and how important they are um, to, to ensuring that their content can be found by users. Um, just because of the way you phrased that, I want to uh, bring up a question that came up in the chat, which is about the, um, are, these, are these platforms limited to library use or are these platforms that we're talking about the kinds of things that individuals can use and can publish on um, by themselves? Um, so anyone, especially for the open source um, platforms, anyone can and, and many do um, use things like OJS, for example, to publish a journal. I can give an example of um, a, a journal that was published at my previous institution where I used to work. Um, and the, the history department, the graduate students in the history department at that um, university wanted to publish a journal. And they started, they spun up their own instance of OJS and started a journal. Um, and they were able to publish it for several years. Um, we talked to them about working with them on it, but they wanted to do it themselves um, un until they had a failure, right? They had a failure of their server. They didn't have their content backed up and they lost everything. And that was the point at which they came to us and said, maybe we actually do want to work with the library. Um, so yes, it is certainly the case that you don't have to be a library. Um, publisher to use, especially the open source platforms. Um, I think it might be prohibitively expensive to use something like Digital Commons um, if you don't, if you're just an individual. I, I have no idea how they would price that, but Digital Commons is a very expensive platform. Um, and some of the other um, non open source platforms are as well. Um, so again, the next uh, point talks about something that I just mentioned, and that is preserving and archiving the digital content in perpetuity, making sure we've got those backups and redundancies in place. Um, so that is something that libraries are really good at historically. We've done this for hundreds of years, and um, even in the digital era, we continue to, to do that. Um, and then sometimes, even though most of these products are not print products um, and they're not really designed to be print products, um, sometimes people do want a print copy of materials. And so library publishing programs are starting to develop expertise around helping their users get print on demand copies of materials that they publish. Um, we can move on, thanks. So what kinds of expertise are needed if you want to um, provide library publishing services? And again, it depends on what kinds of services you're going to provide and how extensive your services are. But these are some of the kinds of expertise you need. As I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned, copyright, um, having copyright knowledge and expertise around fair use and open licensing is generally a pretty good idea to have. Um, for library publishers. We definitely need project management expertise. Um, as you can imagine, um, any type of publishing project is going to have lots of moving parts and pieces. So um, understanding how to manage something, um, a, a, a publishing project from, you know, sort of raw manuscript to final digital product is, is important. Uh, having some budgeting and financial planning expertise is certainly going to be um, advantageous. And policy development is one, um, one area of expertise that I think is actually pretty crucial. When you're starting a new library publishing service, um, there are many things to think about regarding, um, and I'm gonna talk about some of those questions in just a few minutes, in just a couple of minutes. But um, being able to develop policy around decisions you make about the types of services you're going to provide is, is important. Um, and then being able to develop memoranda of understanding. Um, this is something that many library publishers are using rather than a legal contract with our um, folks that we publish with. 
um, we're, we're developing these documents called Memoranda of Understanding where we have um, sort of, it, it, in, it's a fairly simple document. It includes kind of a list of responsibilities. So what the publishing partner, um, the campus partner is going to provide the kinds of work they will do versus the work that the library publisher is going to do. So everything is laid out in black and white and there's no misunderstandings or assumptions that people are making that, you know, like your publishing partner thought they, you as the library publisher were going to do or vice versa. Um, I do have a link out to a very helpful MOU toolkit that was developed by some former colleagues of mine. Um, content acquisition is not necessarily uh, something that is hugely needed. Um, it, it kind of depends on what kinds of services you want to provide, but um, it is definitely something that uh, traditional publishers provide. They usually have content um, acquisition editors, um, but library as a library publisher, it may be something that you want to consider as well. And then having knowledge around publishing workflows is certainly um, a very important sort of aspect of this. So again, how to take a raw manuscript into, um, and how to make it into a professional printed, or not printed, a professional end product. Um, so it may include things like uh, being able to do document or cover design, um, or having a graphic designer on staff or access to a graphic designer that could help with that, um, and doing layout and copy editing. Next slide. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to wrap up quickly here so we have time for questions at the end. Um, I see we have about 15 minutes left. So what kinds of questions should you consider um, before starting a library publishing program? So these are the kinds of questions that when you're developing a policy around the types of services you're going to offer, these are the types of questions that can be really helpful to think very hard about. So how do we decide or how will we decide what we're going to publish as well as what we're not going to publish? So what types of materials are we going to publish? Are we going to publish only journals? Um, are we going to also offer publishing services for books? And if we offer publishing services for books, would we publish something like um, a mystery novel or a, a, some, other, some other sort of you know, popular reading type, more fiction-based uh, work? Or are we only going to publish, you know, scholarly works? Um, because I can promise you that as soon as you start offering library publishing services, people will approach you and say, oh, I have a travel log I want to publish, or I have a memoir I want to publish. So are you going to include those kinds of things in your services? Is, an, is a question you definitely want to sort of lay out um, from the start or, or figure out from the start. Um, and are we going to work only with people on our campus or are we going to work with external folks outside of our campus? Um, so most library publishers only offer publishing services to campus uh, constituents. And um, there are some, however, who do offer publishing services to folks from um, outside of their campuses and a lot of times those are the publishers that are working library publishers that are working in conjunction with a university press because the university presses obviously have um, a lot of experience in offering publishing services to external partners um, are the publishing services going to be 100 percent subsidized by the library or um, and and provided at no cost to our editors and authors or are we going to charge for these services um, so when things are subsidized 100% by the library, um, it tends to keep, keep it a little bit more simple than if you try to start charging um, folks um, for, for the services. And then um, are we going to be 100% committed to open access and allow authors to retain copyright in their materials? Um, and if so, what kinds of open licenses are we going to use? or require or recommend. Um, and then uh, uh, regarding what we publish again, are we going to only publish faculty work or are we also going to include student authored materials? Um, that, that can be a big question. And especially if we take on something that's an ongoing project like a journal, um, students are transient populations at our universities. They come and go usually within four or five years. You may have a very enthusiastic group of students who want to start a journal. Um, if, 
once that enthusiastic group, you know, leaves in two or three or four years, are, is there going to be another group of students coming behind them to continue the work on that journal? So when you're starting up a journal, that is, that is a lot, that's a big investment of time and work. Um, and you don't want to do it if that journal is only going to falter in two or three years. So there needs to be a plan in place for sustainability, um, particularly for ongoing projects. And another question that I think is really important to think about is how we're going to um, how we're going to ensure that we have an equitable and diverse publishing program um, and, and how we're going to indicate that that is important to us. Um, so how, might we talk to our editors and authors about ensuring that their editorial boards are um, diverse and inclusive on um, that kind of thing, um, or that we're including diverse voices in our published products. And lastly, what kinds, what might our criteria be for withdrawing published materials? So um, hopefully that would never happen, but sometimes it is necessary to withdraw material um, because of um, various reasons. So it's a good idea to have a policy in place um, to, to outline how that process might happen. So we can move on. Um, and that is really the end of our um, discussion, the end of our slides today. We'd be happy to take more questions now. I see there, I think a few came up in chat. Yeah, there, there are a couple of questions up in chat. Um, one from that came up pretty early that I, I will put out that you can uh, address. Uh, really about quality control and or peer review and how that is handled in library publishing. Is there, is there quality control? Is there peer review? Um, it depends yeah. on the product, and I'll let Ted speak to this as well, but um, in my experience for journal uh, work, peer review is most commonly done the same way it would be done in a traditional publisher in that the editors that we work with who want to publish these journals will establish an editorial board um, or an advisory board for the journal, and they will when I was talking about the memorandum of understanding, that is usually something that those editors handle. So um, they are the ones who are responsible for um, undertaking peer review, selecting folks to serve on editorial boards, and um, ensuring that that peer review process is handled in a very rigorous manner. Um, as far as monographs um, or books are concerned, it, it varies, again, quite a bit. There are some library publishers that have editorial boards that will, um, and, and if somebody at, on one of those campuses wants to publish a book with that library publisher, um, they have to submit a proposal and the editorial board would consider that proposal very similar to the way a university press would um, and decide whether or not that project is frankly, you know, worthy of being published. Um, there are other library publishers that don't undertake um, quite as rigorous of a peer review process with monographs. Um, so for example, at my previous university, we did not, we did not do that. We were just starting to publish books um, and we were mainly doing sort of conference proceedings, um, which in essence really are peer reviewed because those are conference papers that have been submitted to the conference and then peer reviewed through the conference process. So Ted, what, what has been the, your experience with peer review on different types of materials? Yeah, I think I, everything you said, I, I agree with and that that's been, been my experience too, that um, particularly in serial or in journal publishing that um, a lot of them are peer reviewed. I know, um, one thing I'll add, so most platforms, as Jody mentioned earlier, do provide the ability uh, for uh, some sort of peer review. And I, I can speak to open journal systems specifically. Um, there's the option for um, anonymous, double anonymous, and then also open peer review. Um, so there's different levels or different types of peer review that can be done, um, just as would be done in any other scholarly publication. Okay, so uh, another question from the chat, because uh, you talked about how most libraries work with a campus-based editorial board or campus-based editors, or uh, and are publishing campus, you know, publishing work from campus-based authors. Does that imply that the that any peer review process is also campus-based? How does that tend to work? 
I think that for those library publishers that have established an editorial board for monographs or books, um, or perhaps also ex they would include the expansive digital projects in that um, in this, that those editorial boards would be campus based. Um, they, the, the members of those boards would be faculty on uh, the campus where the library publishing co um, the library publishing program is situated. Um, I think for many of the journals that are published by library publishers, the editorial boards can be composed of faculty members from many different universities. Again, very similar to the way that traditional um, or commercial library or com <laughs> commercial uh, journals are published or, or journals are published by commercial publishers. They would have um, editorial boards from all over the place. Yeah, we, we rely pretty heavily on our faculty editors to leverage their professional networks for reviewers, uh, members of the editorial board, all that sort of thing, similar to what you'd find in, in a more traditional scholarly publishing environment. And, and those editorial boards are, have faculty from all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, one more question from the chat. Uh, th there's uh, interest in hearing whether library, whether there are examples of library publishing programs that offer writing or editing support, um, and whether that writing or writing support might even include grant writing or anything, uh, anything down, those, down that path. Um, in my experience, I, generally, I would say that most writing and editing support is going to be offered through campus in, in, in North America and in US-based um, universities. It's going to be offered through campus organizations such as, so for example, at Emory, we have what's called the Center for Faculty Development and Expertise. And this is, um, it's an on-campus center that helps faculty improve in all types of work they do. So they have help that they can get there with um, how to design a curriculum for a class, as well as help that they, they can get there for um, writing help and editing help. Um, they can also get help there for grant writing, for um, all kinds of different things like that. And we had a similar center at my previous university as well. Um, so I would say that in my experience, most library publishers do not offer that kind of help. Um, now the editing help, uh, copy editing, that is often done with, within you know, the publishing workflow, um, that can vary again by depending on the program. So, um, in my experience, the the library might help out with copy editing through either having somebody on staff who can actually do that copy editing, or they might recommend a freelance copy editor that um, their uh, journal editors could work with. Um, or the editors may take that, the journal editors may take on that task themselves. Um, it's, it's highly variable. Ted, what is your experience with that? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, we, um, our library publishing service certainly doesn't provide any uh, help with the writing piece. Um, I will, um, for new editors, and we often have, um, people who, have, who are starting journals who've never served as an editor for a journal before, um, I'll, I'll advise them on sort of useful practices in terms of, you know, uh, transparency uh, in, in the editorial workflow and kind of helping them establish policies for their journal uh, that align with, you know, um, good practices and open access publishing. But beyond that, I, I, don't, I don't offer much um, help with, with the actual editing. Okay, so uh, questions are definitely popping up in the chat. There is a question about mega journals uh, and th that idea that the UCL London example is, is cited. Um, and how common is it to see that these, these mega journals among library publishing uh, programs? And I can ask for more clarification if you uh, I, need that. So in my experience, a, a mega journal would be something like a PLOS. 
So yes. the, the, it, that, is, that is sort of what I think of when I think of a mega journal. And I don't think many library publishers are producing, if any library publishers would be producing material similar to that. Most mega journals have so much content, it would be very difficult for a library publishing program to, um, to have that kind of put through or, or throughput, I guess is the word I was looking for, to have that, you know, that much content to be able to produce it um, in, in the, the time that's, um, you know, as, as fast as it's needed to be produced. That really requires um, probably more of a commercial or um, something like a PLOS, which is an open access publisher that publishes, you know, thousands of articles every, every year. Um, as Ted mentioned when he was talking about journal publishing with library publishing programs, we really do tend to focus more on niche products that have smaller audiences. Um, Ted, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, and I would just say I think the other limiting factor is so many of our journals are editorial or staff of one person and maybe a graduate student. So yeah, I think just the, the sheer amount of work to create a mega journal would be far beyond what most library publishing outfits are, are capable of. Uh, so, okay, we have a question about the Chinese, Chinese Deathscape project. Uh, noticing, this person noticed it was published by Stanford University Press and asks whether university presses are working with library publishers to publish digital humanities projects. I will just, coming from, coming from Stanford, will, will say that the Stanford University Press, uh, it, it, the, the Chinese Deathscape is one in a series of, of these interactive scholarly works that we are, are putting forward. And that really has been an effort. We have uh, some Mellon Foundation funding for that. And we really are looking to establish a platform that can can put these kind of digital humanities, particularly digital humanities projects, but we would be, you know, would even look more broadly uh, through the through the more traditional publishing process, right? So yes, we really are trying to get to a place where uh, there's a, uh, you know, there's a there's a process for for moving these non-traditional publications. Uh, through the traditional publishing process, which makes them more attractive for, for peer review, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And it makes them, I mean, the other thing is that it gives them that stamp of validity. Um, so, you know, for a junior faculty member looking to get tenure um, or promotion, then they're going to be able to, you know, for a, a digital humanities project that's published by University Press, it's more likely to um, be considered, you know, as a true work of, you know, high level scholarship. Um, and I know that Michigan Publishing is also doing a lot of work. So Michigan Publishing is a joint venture of the University Press, um, the University of Michigan Press and their, their library publishing program. So um, they are definitely engaging in this kind of work as well. I think it's not terribly common yet. I think it will become much more common as, as time goes on. And I see that we're past time. So um, obviously, if you need to drop off, that's fine. Um, I, I can stay a few extra minutes to help answer questions if you can, Todd. Yeah, I just want to take quickly uh, the uh, minute here to thank everybody for participating. Um, certainly, people are going to start to drop off, and I'm going to have to drop off myself very soon. Uh, but but thanks everybody, and thanks Jody and Ted for all of this very helpful information. And we will be um, we will be putting the video and the slides up on the uh, in the ARL website in hopefully within the next week. So um, we'll have more information out for you soon. Did we want to maybe get to this last question or comment? Why don't you take the last, why don't you cover that last question and um, then and I, my computer is, is flaking out on me again. So if you can handle that last question, then we will uh, call okay. it a day. All right, thanks Mimi. Um, so there was a comment here about the quality control issue and um, saying that it's more critical with monographs than with journal articles. Um, yes, and I would agree with that. And yes, um, it, it, 
as library publishing programs mature, I think that's when they're more likely to start getting those editorial boards in. Very often early on in library publishing programs, um, there is not that editorial board. There's not that quality control deciding what's going to be published there. You know, it may just be like the director of publishing decides that that was my former role at my former institution. Um, and, you know, we basically had a policy that we were, we would only publish scholarly material, but there was not a board deciding sort of, you know, on proposals and what would get through. Um, so it, it, is going it does become more important often in that stage of the of the library publishing program they may be publishing things like um, books about the history of the university or history of programs at a given university um, as I mentioned conference proceedings um, other types of scholarly materials that don't necessarily need peer review um, but that and that may not even the, the authors may not even want them to count towards promotion and tenure um, but yes, I think as the programs mature, they generally do need to have something in place um, that's going to show that there's been an, a good editorial review of the material before it's published. Do you have anything to add, Todd? No, we, we don't do much monographic publishing, so that uh, it's something I haven't thought about too much, but I, I would agree with what you just said, Jody. I think uh, that's the area where um, for um, demonstrating quality control and, and for uh, you know proving the utility of these products for for faculty and for readers I think that's something that we'll ha we'll have to grapple with and same for uh, digital humanities projects as well I think getting those reviewed is going to be uh, important and, and potentially tricky I, I agree and again this is I think this is why actually libraries publishing programs don't tend to focus on books and monographs. They don't tend to do as many books and monographs as we do journals. Um, there's a much more well-established process for the quality control and peer review in journals than there is with books. So with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and thanks to my co-presenter, Tad, as well as Mimi um, for hosting us. It's very, very early her time, so we appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.